1972 is the year my mother was born. It's also the year that Shirley Chisholm ran for president. Her role as the first black woman elected to Congress was a sign of the changing times, and her decision to be the first female Democratic Party presidential candidate was a sign that America was speeding ahead. Yet another sign of the 70s being a decade of change was Shirley Chisholm's decision to visit a certain someone in the hospital. This certain someone was a former Dixie Crack governor who desperately wanted to keep his state segregated throughout the 60s and infamously defied JFK. Yes, you've already probably guessed I'm talking about George Wallace, who was wildly popular in the South in the 60s and in 1972 was running for president and saying he no longer believed in segregation. Like many of his political peers yielding to the times, being openly racist just wasn't advantageous. Anywho, on May 15, 1972, Wallace was shot five times by a random guy trying to get famous, and one of his hospital visitors was the brave Shirley Chisholm. The move puzzled her constituents, supporters, and opposition, but in her view was the humane thing to do. Wallace, the avowed racist and liar, won the Democratic primaries in five states. This story from 1972 illustrates how race and gender status were both changing and staying the same. By the end of the decade, these changes in chameleon-like patterns of white male supremacy would become more obvious as we've explored in this series so far. Americans had a lot to reckon with, but the world around them was changing too. In the final episode of Lectual Does the 70s, we'll be discussing global events that formed the basis of Ronald Reagan's foreign policy, the money and tax revolutions that propelled Reagan's platform in non-religious space, and the man himself who would come to symbolize America when the 70s ended. interesting things happening in the 70s. The Soviet Union, which had been the seminal communist threat since 1922, seemed to be gaining influence. Many Americans spent the mid-20th century believing that communists were a single unified threat across Eurasia, with the Soviets at the helm. But that wasn't the truth. By 1969, Chinese and Soviet troops were getting into conflicts along their shared border. The rift between China and the USSR only grew when Nixon visited Beijing in 1972 and began a Chinese-American alliance. But the USSR still seemed strong and so did the Red Scare. Communists wrangled control in Cambodia and Vietnam by 1975. The dictator of Cambodia, on a quest to create a master race, incidentally killed over two million people by 1979 in what would be known as the Cambodian Massacre. Also in 1979, the Soviets took their first military action outside of World War II by sending troops to Kabul to help prop up the fledgling regime, kicking off the decade-long Soviet-Afghan War. It made observers believe communism was on the rise again, though actually Soviets were concerned about an Islamist revolution spreading within their borders, along with dealing with the declining economy. Citizens were also becoming more vocal, which we'll come back to in a moment. As for China, Mao Zedong, who led for 27 years and coincidentally oversaw the Great Chinese Famine, died in 1976. Just 10 years earlier, he had launched the Cultural Revolution, in which there was a backlash against intellectualism, the nation's schools shut down, and many students were shuffled into the Red Guard. This paramilitary group went around harassing, humiliating, assaulting, or even even murdering intellectuals, including doctors, lawyers, and teachers, destroying old books and art, symbols of old traditionalist China, and assaulting dissidents. Civil war led to military dictatorship by late 1968, with fleeing refugees and a death toll somewhere between hundreds of thousands and millions. When Mao died, more than three quarters of the population lived in poverty, with the Communist Party deciding where people worked and what every factory made. Big changes would be ahead in the 80s, thanks to the 1978 rise of the modern architect of China, Deng Xiaoping. Meanwhile, Israel expanded its borders immediately before the 70s began. Thanks in part to a series of disastrous meddling by Britain in the early 20th century, Israel had taken over the land, then referred to as Palestine in 1948 and displaced nearly a million people of Arab descent. Israel's national ideology, Zionism, which promotes their right to their ancestral homeland, promised to them by God in the Bible, had been growing since the late 19th century. The forced exodus of Palestinians is called Nakba, translated in Arabic 
Arabic to disaster or catastrophe and had been taking place since 1947. A series of disagreements and skirmishes between Israel and Jordan, Syria, and Egypt culminated in the Six Day War of 1967 in which Israel won land three times its original size including the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Both territories had large Palestinian populations. During the 70s, there was a rise in military action by wronged Palestinians against Israel, leading to numerous hijacked airplanes, the murder of 11 Israeli athletes and coaches at the 1972 Summer Olympics, which became known as the Munich Massacre, and 1973's October War, in which Egyptian and Syrian armies coordinated an attack to retake land won by Israel in the Six-Day War. The Israelis were backed by America and the Arab nations backed by the Soviet Union. The heavy casualties and violence led to a mutual ceasefire and eventually the first peaceful recognition of Israel by an Arab country, Egypt, in 1978 through the Camp David Accords facilitated by Jimmy Carter. Egypt also began to move away from Soviet influence. Events like the Munich Massacre and the 1973 October War were covered widely in American media, with empathy skewed towards Israelis. America officially defended Israel while other nations through the UN declared Zionism a form of racism in 1975. That resolution would be repealed 15 years later. In America, rhetoric about the Judeo-Christian tradition grew, and open anti-Semitism, which had been dropping since the Holocaust came to light, continued to drop. But not everybody was on board with Israel. There were groups like the American Palestine Committee who took out full page advertisements asking Americans to ponder whether or not is America's foreign policy for sale. In the black community, moderate members of the civil rights movement argued in support of Israel and suggested that African nations who voted to make Zionism a racist concept through the UN had been pressured by quote unquote Arab oil money. Radical and left leaning black Americans supported Palestinians. Internal and external debates over Israel and Palestine haven't stopped since. It was also during the 70s that former colonies the Bahamas, Angola, Cape Verde, Mozambique, and Comoros gained their independence from European empires following an earlier movement of decolonization in Asia and most of Africa by the late 1960s. Millions of colonists left the continent, but many stayed behind. And around 30% of sub-Saharan Africa's highly skilled workers and professionals left the continent for opportunities abroad in the late 60s through the 80s alone, a continuing phenomenon known as brain drain. And countries have dealt with such immigration in different ways. In many areas, instability would remain and neocolonialism would emerge and would play out in future decades. Nations in Africa and South America would struggle through unstable regimes, Western and communist interference and aid, corruption, and more. In 1972, an unknown number of Hutu, some say hundreds of thousands, were murdered by Tutsi in the nation of Burundi. In 1976, student protests broke out in Soweto, South Africa to protest the use of Afrikaans as the chosen language in schools, apartheid, and white minority rule. The Soweto uprising would lead to hundreds of deaths at the hands of police, but also radicalize a generation of South Africans. On March 13, 1979, Maurice Bishop seized control of Grenada as a Marxist. We'll be coming back to him and America's intervention in Grenada in the next decade. Ethiopia suffered a two-year famine that killed over 100,000 people beginning in 1972. It also began fighting with Somalia in 1977, which would go on for the next 11 years in the Ogaden War. Post-colonial literature and ideology came to greater prominence during this era, changing international discourse and expectations. Books like France Fanon's 1961 The Wretched of the Earth and Edward Said's 1978 Orientalism would become key pillars of post-colonialism. With the fall of outright colonization came a growing interest in egalitarianism and a commitment, albeit a begrudging one, to appear to care about respecting the self-governance of all nations including the fragile ones just breaking free of colonial rule. Self-governance, however, would not include allowing these nations to mistreat its citizens thanks to new concerns about human rights. Going back to the Soweto uprising, the negative press that the government received pressured South Africa into making apartheid appear more benign and less violent. The concept of universal human rights had been around since the 17th century, though it was never popular. After all, caring about human rights would mean abolishing slavery, colonization, allowing women to vote and not be treated as inferiors, and finding peaceful ways to settle international disputes rather than defaulting to war. Founding father John Adams wrote to a friend that, 
It is dangerous to open so fruitful a source of controversy and altercation as would be open by attempting to alter the qualifications of voting. There will be no end of it. New claims will arise. Women will demand a vote. Lads from 12 to 21 will think their rights not enough attended to. And every man who is not a farthing will demand an equal voice with any other in all acts of state. Basically, Adams was like, if rich, white, dusty landowners aren't the only ones with rights, eventually everyone will have rights and a say in our government, and I'll be damned. And of course, that is the direction our nation, and many others, has trended ever since. Eventually, this led to human rights activism, such as the establishment of organizations like Amnesty International in London in 1961, which really came to prominence in the 1970s for adopting over 15,000 political prisoners and helping approximately half of them win release. Doctors Without Borders began operating from France in 1971 in disaster zones to bear witness publicly to the plight of the people it assists. This was starkly different from the Red Cross's policy of not criticizing governments for creating the disasters they provided relief to. In Eastern Europe, groups like the Committee on Human Rights and the USSR popped up to keep track of human rights abuses within the Soviet bloc. Because the USSR wanted to continue to enjoy the economic privileges of detente and avoid angering the West, it was much more disinclined to violently root out dissenters as it had in the past. In 1973, the Gulag Archipelago was published by a Soviet expat in which he detailed the experiences of Soviet political prisoners in the Gulag. Human rights activists of this era rejected Cold War ideas about communists and anti-communists and focused on concrete abuses of all regimes. They challenged national policies about labor, immigration, race, women, free speech, and torture. In America, members of Amnesty International grew from 6,000 in 1970 to 35,000 in 1970. In all the time leading up to the 70s, when we began concerning ourselves with human rights, America had always built itself as anti-imperialist. Even while we invaded kingdoms like Hawaii for a strategic naval base or seized nations like the Philippines and Puerto Rico, we acted like we were crusaders of sovereignty. But during the 70s, America was forced to minimally reckon with its own track record. In addition to the brutal violence of the 1960s civil rights movement, there were revelations of anti-democratic behavior overseas like 1969's My Lay Massacre. The CIA's Phoenix program used various methods from torture to assassination to stamp out the Viet Cong during the Vietnam War. Hella atrocities happened at CIA-backed interrogation centers. Journalist Doug Valentine listed several methods of torture, including rape, gang rape, rape using eels, snakes, or hard objects, and rape followed by murder, electric shock, beatings with rubber hoses and whips, the use of police dogs to maul prisoners, and more. All of this was to collect information for a war we eventually lost, with the CIA effectively neutralizing at least 81,000 people throughout the program's run between 1965 and 1972. Revelations about American human rights violations is what partially fueled interest in human rights ideology along with wide-scale protests against the Vietnam War in the early 70s. Such protests further exposed America's own domestic human rights abuses, like the killing of four student protesters at Kent State in 1970. Also, America's coarse abuse of human rights in the 70s helped radicalize a generation of political thinkers and activists who serve as anchors for modern ideologies and discourse today. Ready to make itself sinless enough to throw stones, the first congressional hearings on human rights were held in 1973 chaired by Minnesota Democrat Donald Fraser. Such hearings grew between 1974 and 1976, and Congress eventually began rescinding aid to countries found to most egregiously violate human rights. Several Latin American countries refused aid upon hearing human rights requirements, which Jimmy Carter, by the way, was a big champion of, in direct contrast to Nixon and Henry Kissinger, who believed only the external actions of foreign governments mattered, not the actions they took towards their own citizens. This this pivot towards concern for human rights was not all positive vibes and sunshine, and as anyone watching this channel likely knows, would have resounding effects on American foreign policy in the decades to come. Not only are we hypocritical about what constitutes human rights abuses, we use the ideology to poke our noses in conflicts that have nothing to do with us. For example, a study of 164 countries between 1981 and 2005 that compared the reasons the U.S. has intervened in foreign conflicts showed that the United States is more likely to engage in a military campaign to protect human rights than for threats to democracy or terrorist activity. But it's important to note that the U.S. government often says its reasons for intervention
reasons are about human rights when usually there's an underlying ulterior motive. For instance, the public narrative of the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq involves protecting Iraq and its neighbors from weapons of mass destruction. The real narrative involves oil and instilling American allies into Iraqi positions of power. Because if it's one thing America is gonna do, it's gonna always be all about the money. signaled the changing tide of America's money landscape in quite a few ways. Visa cards were released in 1976 when credit card spending was just $14 billion a year. By 1982, it would be $66 billion, a number that would only increase. Prior to the 1970s, most Americans avoided credit and debt, especially those who had lived through the Great Depression. Historian Bruce L. Shulman explained that with double-digit inflation, thriftiness became just plain dumb. Saving money meant paying for tomorrow's higher-priced goods with yesterday's diminished dollars. Borrowing, on the other hand, made sense. You could purchase something today before the price went up and pay for it later with inflated dollars that were worthless. At the same time, businessmen were looking to skirt the Depression-era Regulation Q, which put a cap on the amount of interest a bank could pay to depositors. This regulation helped stabilize banks, but limited the pockets of the wealthy. In 1972, the Money Market Mutual Fund was created to invest in Treasury bills and large certificate of deposits that were exempt from Regulation Q. The Money Market Mutual Fund was high return and low risk, ideal for investors, but hard for people to participate in and not very withdrawal friendly. Money was easy to put in, but not easy to take out. Other mutual funds followed. There was Fidelity Investments, who provided check writing privileges for investors, which attracted more people. As the 70s progressed, new advertising, telephone, and marketing technology allowed Fidelity to sell stock mutual funds to average Americans, who invested just about $1.7 billion in money funds in 1972. Ten years later, Americans invested $200 billion. As more Americans became investors, there was more pressure to deregulate the stock market. In 1975, the New York Stock Exchange got rid of fixed brokerage conditions. These conditions made sure that there was no price competition among brokers, but also made small stock purchases not important enough to pursue. The elimination of these fixed brokerage conditions allowed companies like Charles Schwab to flourish by handling small investments for a new target customer, the middle class. A 1978 feature article detailed how major Wall Street brokerages hated the discount count stockbroker for tapping into the new middle class market. Schwab explained his success thusly. If you ask us which way the stock market is going or which stock to buy, we say we don't know. We never have a customer who gets mad at us for bad advice since we don't give any advice at all. Deregulation was occurring in other industries too. In 1978, Act of Congress made airlines create more flights, which meant more seats, which meant lower prices. How low? Flight prices declined by 51% over the next three decades. In 1975, 55% of airline seats were filled. It would be 60% in 1980. The service was no longer lush and luxurious like in the 60s when only super wealthy white Americans could afford tickets. Back then, there were extravagant meals, lots of space, endless smoking, and bottomless drinks. While such service was abandoned in later decades for the grubby plebes flying economy, flight sales continued to explode. The rise of commercial air travel even caused a surge in conquering the fear of flying in the late 70s, and there were courses people could pay to take for such a fear. Another trend that began in the 70s was the decrease in social capital among Americans. Social capital are the networks, norms, and trust that enables people to act together cohesively to achieve shared desires. By checking surveys and membership records of civic and volunteer groups, clubs, churches, etc., experts have noticed that since the 70s, there has been an erosion of social social connections and informal socializing, along with time devoted to clubs and orgs. In 2001, political scientist Robert Putnam pointed the blame to television, which became bigger than ever during the decade. The fall of social capital and participation in civic duties would lead to more individualistic attitudes and bipartisanship, something we'll see play out in later decades. Growing sentiments of individualism definitely played a role in what would come to be known as the tax revolt. Despite the fact that America 
Americans paid the lowest per capita taxes than any industrialized nation apart from Japan, stagflation meant that small raises to keep up with cost of living bumped people up into higher tax brackets. And our polls show that Americans both wanted to cut taxes and maintain social programs. So California had been experiencing property tax rebellion since the post-World War II era. During the 60s and early 70s, tax rebels wanted to shift the state's budgetary burden to the wealthy and businesses, not shrink the government and taxes, aka tax equity. After louder radical black and brown voices and stagflation and other economic woes of the 70s, tax protesters demanded steep tax cuts across the board, not tax equity. Many Californians were landlords or homeowners dealing with soaring property values and higher incomes that didn't keep up with cost of living. From 1976 to 1977, new property assessments in the state led to protests and the political action of groups like Taxpayers United for Freedom and the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association. They sent over 200,000 letters to Governor Jerry Brown demanding a special session of the state legislature for tax relief, which he refused to organize. So these angry tax rebels collected 1.25 million signatures to put Prop 13 on the state ballot in June 1978. Prop 13 would limit property tax increases based on inflation. Most of the outright opposition came from black Californians and public employees. Wrote the leader of the Progressive Democratic Club in San Pedro to the local paper, if you are a homeowner, Prop 13 is gonna put some money in your pocket. But is it really the miracle cure it claims to be? Check it out a little further and you'll see that Proposition 13 is a scam, an enormous tax break for big businesses and apartment house owners under the cover of helping the individual homeowner. He urged readers to vote for Proposition 8 instead, which would lower taxes for all homeowners by 30%, but not commercial property. Other opposers to Prop 13's tax cuts claim that California's economy would be doomed and public services would end. They also played on people's belief in law and order, theorizing that a loss in property tax revenue would lead to less police and firemen. Most Californians were not concerned, especially since California's budget surplus was nearly $6 billion. Even worse, LA was preparing to increase property assessments by an average of 125%, doubling or tripling home values and further terrifying homeowners. Prop 13 passed by a two to one margin. Property owners saw taxes drop by 57% and it was ensured that home values could not rise any more than 2% a year unless they were sold and then reassessed at market value. Prop 13 also made sure that any increase in state taxes would require a two-thirds vote of the legislature. The passage of Prop 13 stunned Americans who were paying attention. In the following decade, 37 states reduced property taxes and another 28 cut income taxes to avoid facing a similar backlash from voters. Tax cuts suddenly became a legitimate talking point for conservatives. Going into the 1980s, tax cuts now meant reducing public services and turning towards the private sector for desired amenities because desired amenities could also mean immoral purposes, as often spun by new right politicians and activists critiquing the federal government, there were calls for such conservative taxpayers to not have to pay for them. Immoral purposes such as sex ed, birth control, radical curricula, and especially welfare for minorities and single mothers. This kind of anti-tax and anti-leftist rhetoric fused perfectly to attract different people to the conservative right, even if they weren't religious, appealing to those who desired lower taxes and or no equity for minorities would become a key component of the Reagan campaign and other politicians as well. The 1978 midterm election saw many Republican candidates running on tax cut plans based on a proposal by Representative Jack Kemp of New York and Senator William Roth of Delaware. The Kemp-Roth plan called for a reduction of all federal income taxes by 30% across the board. People were wary of the unsuccessful plan, but it would come back with a vengeance during the Reagan administration. Though the plan failed to pass before Reagan was elected, Republicans won 11 seats in the House and three in the Senate in 1978, elevating future political figures Newt Gingrich and Dick Cheney. By the way, did you know Newt Gingrich married his high school geometry teacher who was seven years older than him and divorced her when she was struggling with uterine cancer? Yeah, that's a lot. Anywho, tax revolts had another unforeseen effect, a boom in shopping malls, which would become a central cultural symbol of 1980s America. How? 
Because local governments were suddenly deprived of once reliable revenue from property taxes, they needed to find alternative sources of income. Shopping malls meant astronomical sales tax revenue, and erecting the giant retail meccas were prioritized in city plans. Malls that had been built in the 60s were renovated and expanded to accommodate more businesses. Grocery stores, which in decades prior often operated in malls, moved out by the mid-70s because they couldn't keep up with soaring rent. While clothing and accessories retail could sell ridiculously priced things, grocery stores couldn't sell food for higher profits. Of course, like, malls are, like, totally something we'll, like, be coming back to and, like, Lectual does the 80s, so, like, don't even worry. Malls and by association credit card debt in the 70s foreshadowed the wave of unchecked consumption that would occur in the Reagan era. More than that, it was a catalyst that encouraged and enraged environmentalists. They were also motivated by the numerous environmental disasters and scandals that happened throughout the decade. In 1976, scientist Johannes Rook published his findings that carcinogens were lurking in drinking water. In 1979, a partial meltdown at a nuclear facility in Pennsylvania that released dangerous gases into the atmosphere, known as the Three Mile Island accident, led to a backlash against nuclear energy. That same year, 90 million gallons of radioactive uranium spilled in Church Rock, New Mexico. Not only were residents not adequately informed about the toxic spill, but studies on effects of the toxic waste on the residents, who are predominantly Navajo, were not started until the 21st century. These disasters and scandals, along with the unrestrained consumption made possible by the free market, was proof to environmentalists that hyper-individualism and industrialization was irresponsible and unsustainable. Many environmentalists also pushed overpopulation narratives, pointing to the knowledge that the nation's population had tripled since 1900. Rapid population growth across the globe had led to so-called green revolution measures to scientifically cultivate higher food yields, leading to environmental harm like the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. While environmentalism had been growing since at least the post-World War II era and later with the publication of 1962's Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, mainstream discourse around the environment grew during the 70s. For instance, terms like ecosystem and biosphere became popular. While there were a few federal stabs at environmental protection in the early 70s, by the dawn of the Reagan era, profits would continue to usually be prioritized over people's health and the environment, a theme we would struggle with for decades to come. Ronald Reagan was born in 1911 in Illinois. As a teen, he worked as a lifeguard and later as a student at Eureka College, he studied economics and sociology. In the early 30s, he was a radio announcer for the Chicago Cubs before transitioning into a budding acting career. Before he could become a major star, he was called into active military duty, where he mainly participated in motion picture units that created training films for the Air Force. After military duty, he returned to making films and even served as president of the Screen Actors Guild seven times. His presidency was a key part in making residuals required for television actors when their performances were rerun. While that's nice and all, it was later revealed that during the late 40s, Reagan and his first wife, Jane Wyman, were giving the FBI names of actors who they believed to be communist sympathizers. Reagan was originally a Democrat who gradually moved to the right. In 1960, when the legislation that became Medicare was announced, he said, we will awake to find that we have socialism. And if you don't do this, and if I don't do it, one of these days you and I are gonna spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in America when men were free. Over free healthcare, nigga. Niggas ain't free because they getting free healthcare. I can't. This stance against government provided healthcare was just one of the instances in the 1960s that showcased what will become his presidential platform in the elections of the 70s. In 1962, he narrated the film The Truth About Communism. Other 1960s Democrat measures he opposed were raising the minimum wage and providing food stamps. Most importantly, he promoted the conservative beliefs of 1964 presidential candidate Barry Goldwater in a much more efficient and likable way. His speeches on Goldwater didn't help Goldwater himself, but propelled Reagan further into the national limelight as a potential contender for the presidency one day. More importantly, the speeches and responses to them gave him the confidence to announce in 1965 his campaign for governor of California. His two major themes, 
to send the welfare bums back to work and to clean up the mess at Berkeley, aka targeting the Negroes and the Vietnam War protesters. Racist, fiscal conservatives, and Vietnam War supporters had found their man. In 1966, he defeated the twice elected Democrat governor, Pat Brown, with 57.5% of the vote. As California governor, he criticized universities for their allegedly soft treatment of protesters, sent the National Guard to occupy Berkeley for 17 days, reluctantly signed a pro abortion bill he later regretted, and the legislation that Reagan most regretted during his time as California governor was signed in 1969. It was the first no-fault divorce legislation in the U.S. His family values supporters in the late 70s and 80s probably skipped over that detail. A law Reagan never regretted was the Mulford Act. The bill had been produced to stop the Black Panther Party for self-defense from legally policing their own neighborhoods. The bill would repeal an earlier law allowing the public carrying of loaded firearms. The Black Panther Party marked into the California state capitol with guns sped up the legislation, which Reagan, a card-carrying NRA member, would sign happily in 1967. Despite losing the Republican primary to Nixon in 1968, Reagan was re-elected as California's governor in 1970. Though he lost the Republican primaries to Gerald Ford in 1976, the margin was slim, signifying his growing influence among Republicans. They especially loved how he accused Ford of being soft on communism and having a weak foreign policy and how he emphasized that the military needed to reclaim its global status. By the time the election season for the 1980 election began, Reagan was a crowd favorite. During the entirety of the Carter presidency, he held frequent radio addresses and knew how to attract voters. He focused on the federal government's propensity to overspend, overstimulate, and overregulate. He touted his commitment to family values and destroying communism instead of succumbing to detente. He also loved discussing states' rights, Cadillac driving welfare queens, and strapping young bucks buying T-bone steaks with food stamps. These racist dog whistle terms seized on the racial atmosphere of the late 70s. A 1977 national opinion research poll showed that two-thirds of the white respondents agreed with the term, blacks shouldn't push themselves where they're not wanted. Reagan had numerous KKK members working for his campaign, and his own beliefs were further substantiated when he made an appearance seven miles away from Philadelphia, Mississippi on August 3, 1980. He said, I still believe the answer to any problem lies with the people. I believe in states' rights. If Philadelphia, Mississippi sounds familiar to you, that's because it's the small town where three civil rights workers were murdered by KKK members and law enforcement in 1964. Politicians know about optics. Ain't nobody stupid. Only two days after that speech, Reagan spoke before the National Urban League in New York, telling his audience of black listeners that, I am committed to the protection and enforcement of the civil rights of black Americans. For too many people, conservative has come to mean anti-poor, anti-black, and anti-disadvantaged. His speech was, of course, well received by black moderates and assailed by leftists. Reagan's blatantly contradictory campaign would no doubt come full circle in the 1980s. A major focus for voters was the ongoing Iran hostage situation, which began in 1979 when a group of Iranian students entered the U.S. Embassy in Tehran and took over 52 hostages, who would be held for 444 days. The direct cause of the hostage situation was Jimmy Carter's decision to allow the expelled Shah of Iran, an installed American ally, into the country for medical treatment. The hostage situation also served as a way for the Iranian students to call for an end of American interference in Iran. Despite frequent attempts at negotiations, Carter could not secure a release for the hostages. They weren't released until January 21st, 1981, just hours after Ronald Reagan's inaugural address. Though Reagan did nothing, it was one of the earliest events that signified a new era with a heroic leader who got things done. Another big blow to Carter's crumbling chances to win the presidency was the ab scam scandal, which was broadcasted widely on television. For two years, agents of the FBI posed as fictional representatives of a fake Arab sheik and bribed hella elected officials at the local, state, and federal levels. Originally beginning with buying stolen art, the FBI eventually uncovered people who sold fake stocks and bonds, and later, New Jersey politicians who were willing to be bribed for coveted casino deals in Atlantic City and special legislation. The operation was reported 10 months before the election. Seven of the people arrested and convicted were congressmen, and all of them were Democrats except one. This, plus Jimmy Carter's inability to end the Iran hostage crisis, would be his final undoing. 
Reagan seized the opportunity to further denounce big government, Democrats, and point out corruption on the watch of Jimmy Carter. At 69 years old, Reagan would win the electoral and popular votes in landslides, making him the oldest person at the time to be elected for a first term. He carried 44 states, and Republicans won control of the United States Senate for the first time since 1955. But the 1970s are over, baby. In this series, we have covered a lot of ground. Do you understand now why at the beginning of the series I said that the decade was more than bell bottoms and orgies? It was a pivotal decade for America. The kiddos were okay, but in a 70s kind of way, with all the serial killers, cults, and the general permissive culture that allowed children to be exploited and endangered. While much of the nation suffered from a stagnant economy, those with money and power erected new rules and trampled on old ones that would have political and economic ramifications in years to come. The wealth gap between the poor and rich would grow wider, while a newly minted middle class looked hopefully to the future. Black Americans gained new rights and demanded more, became pop cultural icons, burrowed further into electoral politics, and still suffered from systematic racism that had mutated into something much sneakier and friendlier than the racism of the pre-civil rights movement. Americans of all colors became more individualistic and tribalistic, while while also living in a world becoming increasingly globalized. Globalization meant that nations were more at the mercy of international money markets, but it also meant that there were new cultures to explore, new goods and technology to enjoy, new trends to dive into, and more ways to express oneself than ever before. American culture flooded other nations in unforeseen levels, and English finally became the world's primary language of markets and social interactions. Self-expression was increasingly important in the various movements to procure rights for marginalized groups, from indigenous people to women to the elderly. Women of all colors gained new rights and freedoms, even though the majority of them would never identify as feminists and in fact never have. The LGBT movement gained momentum before AIDS and Reagan would chip away at progress. Fear of marginalized groups drove the organization of the new right and would continue to play a role in America in the 80s, and yes, you already know, America now. The various groups in the new right came together inorganically and efficiently, and the variety of ideologies on that side of the spectrum could be its own series altogether. But I think I've done what I set out to do when I created this series, giving you a well-rounded look at the decade that my own 12th grade United States history course never even covered. It's a decade that deserves more love and study, and I hope this series has given you a lot to ponder, and I hope you check out the books and readings I've been listing on Patreon. So up next, I've been working on Lectual Does the 80s for the past six months or so, and I can't wait to bring that series to you later this year. If you've enjoyed Lectual Does the 70s and learned something new, please tell me your favorite thing in the comments. Also, support intellectual media content by grabbing a Lectual Does the 70s poster or keychain from my store. Thanks so much for watching, and thank you to all my patrons for helping me produce this feature-length series.